CCS is a, is a really great program. Um, we should be proud in California to have it. It is unique um, in the United States to have a program like this that is focused on um, guaranteeing access to pediatric subspecialty physician care for children with complex medical conditions. So, uh, like uh, Lucy said, we are, we are going to be talking about the nuts and bolts of CCS. I have, I have no disclosures except for the fact that I love stick-on mustaches. Uh, and uh, one of the things about CCS, um, each county has its own California Children's Services Division in California. Um, and we have agreements with the unified school districts in those counties in order to provide uh, occupational and physical therapy services within uh, unified school district buildings. And we're not allowed to decorate those buildings or paint them or do anything because it's really the unified school district who is in control of those buildings. So in order to decorate for us in, in San Francisco, we use something that uh, an old pediatrician uh, colleague of mine, partner of mine, um, uh, first started uh, with me, and I love it. And it's, to, uh, it's to have um, all the kids take pictures of them wearing mustaches. And so we have them all over the clinic, and it makes those kids feel like this is their, their space. And it's um, a really lovely thing that I suggest to you to consider or come up with your own idea. Um, could have uh, like unibrows or something. I don't know. <laughs> all right. So learning objectives for today, um, we're going to talk about the history and the basics of what is California Children's Services. We're going to talk about eligibility for CCS. We're going to talk about the services that are offered through the program and what CCS is not, because that's really important here at a, a developmental disabilities conference. We're going to talk about the medical therapy program, um, which uh, there, are, there are three parts to CCS. There's one that is uh, uh, that you have income eligibility, um, and then the other two parts of the program, one is the medical therapy program, the other one is the high-risk infant follow-up program. Neither of those uh, requires uh, income eligibility, um, and so we'll, we'll just briefly mention those a little bit later. I want to talk about different counties have different uh, models for uh, providing case management. Um, there's a whole child model, there's an independent county model, and then there's a de dependent county model. And it, you know, we are making things very confusing for families, especially when they move from county to county and have to contend with different uh, systems. Um, who can refer to CCS and how to do that? And then just a little bit, just gonna touch on what happens when CCS goes away after 21 years of age. So, the basics. In 1927, there was a polio outbreak, and there were a lot of kids who ended up being um, uh, paralyzed, um, but being cognitively intact. And they wanted those children to be able to go on to access their community and be as independent as possible and not be homebound. And so they created a program called, isn't this great, Crippled Children's Program of California. So, um, at that time, um, when they created it, it was created out of the medical part of the budget in California, um, which made it different from what eventually became the Department of Developmental Services to support children with developmental behavioral conditions um, through the Lanterman Act in 1979. So a lot of time went by before um, the Lanterman Act happened, and at that time, CCS was separate and is, continues to be separate um, from the D Department of Developmental Services. So they keep them separate. It's a separate pot of money, and that's why it's so confusing why a lot of children with developmental conditions do not actually qualify for California Children's Services. Some do and some don't. And people with uh, spastic cerebral palsy do. So um, this is, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So the mission of um, CCS really, when you boil it down, is to guarantee access to pediatric subspecialty physician care for children with specific complex medical conditions that have been identified as requiring pediatric subspecialty physician care. Um, they also, we also provide physical and occupational therapy for kids who have um, spastic conditions um, specifically, but also uh, some conditions that are 
progressive, um, leading to muscle weakness like muscular dystrophy, myasthenia gravis. Um, we have uh, physical and occupational therapists in each county who are experts at, at determining equipment needs for those children. Um, we have case managers, nurse case managers, who, uh, who staff uh, the main offices in each of our counties, especially independent counties, um, and they can facilitate kids going to, going between medical systems, let's say a child with a uh, heart disease that can only be treated at Stanford, goes to Stanford for that, but they live in San Francisco and they get all the rest of their care at UCSF. There's no insurance product in the world at this point that enables someone to go to Stanford and UCSF at the same time because they're competing. So, so that's what CCS enables kids to be able to do. Um, and then it's ultimately to improve care for the most complex children um, and decrease costs in the long run. That's the goal. Eligibility. So you have to be under 21 years of age. You have to be a permanent resident of the California County where you apply. For the um, main CCS program that includes the case management and uh, payment of medical services, surgical, surgical services, rehabilitation, medicines, equipment, um, you have to either be a Medi-Cal uh, patient, and for people who, through the regional center, are, um, they have the Medi-Cal waiver, uh, they, are, they have Medi-Cal. So if they have a medical condition that qualifies for CCS, they can actually have that part of CCS, the one that requires financial eligibility. Um, or the family earns less than $40,000 per year, or the CCS eligible medical condition, the specific one that they, makes them eligible for CCS, costs the family more than 20% of their adjusted gross income. So you have to have a medical condition that is eligible under CCS, and think of chronic lifelong conditions that require pediatric subspecialty medical care, like congenital heart disease, cancers, bleeding disorders, um, intractable seizure disorders, uh, transplants. You get the idea. Um, so services provided. Um, for the specialized treatments that get covered, if you, are, if you have Medi-Cal or you're financially eligible, um, the board certified physician services. Okay, so you have to, to be a doctor that provides services under CCS, you have to be paneled. And to be paneled, you have to be board certified, you have to have um, a clean record. Um, let's see, you can also, uh, you, you, we pay for hospital and surgical care, rehabilitation, um, skilled nursing, lab tests, radiology, medical equipment, supplies, and medicines. Um, like I said, you, uh, you have to be cared for by a paneled provider um, at institutions that have been approved by CCS. There's something called special care centers, um, which are parts of, usually parts of children's hospitals where you have uh, a multidisciplinary approach to care around a specific medical condition. So let's say like spina bifida, where you have um, surgeons, you have, uh, maybe you have urologists, nephrologists, um, neurologists, all together, um, nurses, social workers, psychologists, all together in one um, special care center, and there are, there's a specific way for billing underneath that special care center um, that enables all, all that care to be covered um, at a, at a uh, paneled uh, service center like, like UCSF or Children's Hospital Oakland or some of the other um, hospitals that might be closer to you. There's the medical case management, and the nurses are available to families. Families can call in and ask for help. Let's say that they show up at the pharmacy and they can't get their medicines for whatever reason. Uh, the pharmacy's holding back, or their Medi-Cal has lapsed, whatever. They can call the case manager, and the nurse case managers can uh, facilitate that and get that fixed. 
And then there's the medical therapy program. And um, like I said, it's physical and occupational therapy in San Francisco. We have three different centers. We have one that's in the Sunset District, one that's here very near City Hall, and then we have another one that's in an uh, elementary school called Flynn Elementary School, and our therapists go there, and the kids um, are bused um, to those centers or um, their families bring them there. And, uh, and our therapists are just astonishingly good. Um, high-risk infant follow-up program. So the high-risk infant follow-up program is a program for children who've had a rocky course in the neonatal intensive care unit. And those kids, when they become eligible, again, there's no, there's no income eligibility. So it's um, any kids who've had a, a difficult course in the intensive care unit um, after birth they get referred to the high-risk infant follow-up program, and there are three uh, visits that are paid for by CCS that covers the cost of a developmental specialist um, to be able to do those assessments on those kids um, over the first three years of life. So what, what isn't CCS? Um, so because of the different funding streams and the, because of the way it all has been set up, it is not developmental, behavioral, or low tone conditions. And one of the reasons why um, low tone conditions aren't always covered under CCS um, is because over time, um, many of the genetic conditions that, uh, that are associated with developmental uh, disability, often they come with low tone. And so automatically, low tone conditions aren't, they're not always uh, included in, in the number of conditions that are um, eligible for, for the program. It uh, doesn't mean that low, all low tone conditions are, are eliminated, it just means that um, it is not automatically uh, made eligible, um, and there has to be something else going on with the child um, to have them be eligible for the program. It is not primary care, although in the whole child model, the idea was to uh, try and have CCS um, be underneath the auspices of a Medi-Cal managed care plan that's responsible for both primary and subspecialty care. Um, and the idea is good, but the implementation has not been so great. Um, it is not short-term things like um, someone, you know, breaking a bone or uh, uh, having um, a hernia surgery, for example. Something that is, that needs surgical intervention, but that won't last that child uh, for their life long. Like, that is, uh, th that is not a CCS uh, type of a condition. The medical therapy program. So, as you can see, now we finally have some mustache pictures. Uh, so medically necessary physical and occupational therapy, it's, uh, it's therapy with a goal, and kids have to achieve the goals or at least, at least be able to work towards the goals that the therapists are setting up for the kids. Um, it, does, it does cover the kids all the way up until their 21st um, birthday, so when they turn 21, the program goes away, so the idea is to try and get the caregivers to be the expert physical and occupational therapists and to soak up as much as they can from the therapists that we have in the center. Um, everybody comes to our centers as opposed to us going into their homes and providing therapies there. Whereas with the regional center in the early start program, the therapies that are offered, they often can go into the home. So that is, that is one difference. Um, between the types of therapies early on up until three years of age for early start versus the medical therapy units in California Children's Services. And then there's physical and occupational therapy that's offered at the schools, and that's really focused on, um, and that's offered by the school districts, and that's focused on enabling those kids to succeed at school and to be present at school, do, do school activities, be able to hold a pencil, be able to you, type on a keyboard, those kinds of things. Um, and so it's a different type of therapy, whereas the therapy in the medical therapy unit is really focused on trying to get these kids as independent as possible by the time they're 21 years of age. And again, it's no cost to the family, it's a public service. Um, so, eligibility for services, we talked about you have to residentially qualify, you have to um, have an el eligible medical condition, you have to be under 21, and you have to financially uh, qualify. In medical therapy program, everything's the same except 
It's based on physical exam, okay? So if you have something, a neurologist sends me a note that says, uh, uh, this is a child um, who you know, does not have, um, who has a normal physical exam, and at the end it says, this child has uh, cerebral palsy, um, they should be eligible for the medical therapy program. So that doesn't work. It's not about the diagnosis. It's about the physical exam of the child and whether our physical and occupational therapist can identify, uh, based on the physical exam, uh, interventions that would make sense in the medical therapy unit program. So, so it's really, um, when you want to refer a, a child for the medical therapy unit program, make sure it's a neurologist, an orthopedist, or a rehab doctor who has done a thorough physical exam, because without a thorough and accurate physical exam, they're probably not gonna qualify. All right, so three different possibilities um, at, across counties in California for what your case management might look like. There are independent counties, like Alameda County and, and San Francisco, where um, all the case management occur and administration of the program occurs um, at the county level, so in the public health department, and that's where we are here um, in San Francisco. We have two different me Medi-Cal managed care plans um, that manage all of the Medi-Cal patients in San Francisco. We have Anthem Blue Cross and we have San Francisco Health Plan, okay? What happened was, um, Several years ago, the idea was to try and roll out this whole child model program, which uh, was to hand over the CCS case management and administration of the program, primarily the case management, to the Medi-Cal managed care plans in those counties. For the counties that only had one Medi-Cal managed care plan, it made it simple for the state to do this. And that's why there are 21 counties that have now been told to be whole child model where they got rid of their county nurses uh, for CCS and instead um, now all of the case management is supposed to happen through the Medi-Cal managed care plan. Okay, so like Marin is that way. Um, if you go down to in San Mateo is that way. So there are counties that are right next to each other that have different programs. So in independent counties, the county is in, in charge of the CCS program case management. In whole child model counties, the contracted Medi-Cal managed care plan is in charge of it. And then there are dependent counties, which are the smaller counties. And in the smaller counties, or more rural often, um, it's state employees who do the case management, and so uh, if a family needs help with something um, around their medical care, or getting access to pediatric subspecialty care, they call um, someone at the state who can help them do that. How to access CCS. So anyone can refer a child to CCS. The family themselves can refer. Um, the uh, providers, subspecialty providers, the primary care providers can refer. Um, on my slide here, um, I've, cr I've left you the form for what they call a service authorization request form. This is what a physician would fill out in order to um, uh, tell us, in order to refer a patient, okay? So um, that top one is the form that you're gonna need to send to your county CCS program if you wanna open a case. For families to submit an application, that's the next um, that's the next uh, link right there. And then for a medical therapy program referral, please again, make sure that um, it's a subspecialist who would understand the neurologic findings or neuromuscular findings that would make them eligible for medical therapy program, a neurologist, uh, a physiatrist, or an orthopedist. Um, so life after 21, okay? So this is a major problem with all care for, for children with complex health issues. I mean, children who qualify for the regional center, that's a wonderful thing as far as availability of case management after you turn 21. But for everyone else, and you know, there are lots of people who don't qualify for CCS or regional center, but still have special health needs. And what do they do for care coordination? I mean, there really is very little. And there are not many adult care providers, adult subspecialists, 
who actually have case management available in their clinics. And if you do have that in your community, um, that's magic. That's, that really is uh, a prize. Um, so there is nothing for adults that replaces CCS at this point. Um, I think that there is an effort to address this. Um, and hopefully in the, in, in the coming five to 10 years, we will see some care coordination uh, that's available, especially for the most complex adult patients. Um, but right now, um, it doesn't exist. Um, let's see, I think I talked about everything on that slide. This is, our, um, this is my nurse manager um, in San Francisco, Katie Kim, um, and thank you for, for having me, and I hope that, uh, and I, I really wanna thank Lucy Crane for continuing to have this conference, it's so important. Um, this is a group of, of families that uh, really do need our help and do not have a loud enough voice in this state, and um, I, I'm really happy that you're here, that we can all work together to make their lives um, a little more manageable. Um, here's my contact information, should you need that. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm giving him more time to speak. I never have done that before, but he was one of my residents a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, do you wanna ask questions? Should we do that? Yeah, let I mean, me ask you, why yeah. are developmental behavioral pediatricians not on that list that can refer to the medical therapy unit? So, um, we know about PT. Yeah, so, de de so um, developmental behavioral pediatricians, I mean, so some developmental beha behavioral pediatricians are excellent um, at physical exam, and some are not. And that's just because, you know, they are not, um, they're not necessarily uh, prescribing, let's say, um, neurologic medications or, or being, um, you know, that's not really what they were trained to do. Um, I so think, I think they are, and we have our boards now, too. Okay, well, I mean, so then um, if you feel strongly and the, um, and uh, is it the Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, if they want to submit a request to CCS at the state level um, to consider that. I mean, I would say that the, the medical directors in each of the counties, they get to know the physicians in the community. And for example, uh, we have a behavioral developmental specialist who sees all of the kids in a case conference uh, who are from Kaiser in San Francisco. Um, and his name is Russell Rafe. And, and we actually do take physical exams from him. So the medical consultants get to know the doctors, and if there's a behavioral developmental specialist who's particularly accurate at physical exam, we get to know that, and we will um, consider that. Yeah, we'll, we'll weigh that for sure. I didn't mean to put you on this. That's okay. You can be angry at me for any reasons. I love you. Okay. <laughs> okay, questions. Keep him talking. Go ahead. Do you want to come up to the mic? And of course, you got to make me walk after I sprain my ankle. Um, so I know we're in the medical model, um, and have you, you know, with the shortage of adult provi uh, medical providers who see adults who feel comfortable working with adults, um, have you considered partnering with the school districts or transition programs and making healthcare part of the transition programs? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, so. So there is, um, so the CCS program is very limited in its, in its official scope. Um, however, because we exist underneath public health department, uh, public health departments um, normally in most of the counties, we do extend our, our duties to representing and advocating for families who have children with complex health needs. Um, because of that, for example, in San Francisco, uh, I'm sort of in charge of bringing together um, interagency communities, or I should say uh, creating, creating work groups and councils to address specific issues, and one of them is the child to adult transition work group that we have in town. And uh, we have the insurers there. We have um, 
the regional center, um, the independent living resource center. Uh, we have um, uh, CCS. We have. I mean, we have about. 30 different organizations all represented there. One of them is the Unified School District. Um, and one of our biggest challenges is finding adult providers um, who are willing to take kids with complex health issues. And it's a mixture of reasons why. Some, um, some doctors feel intimidated by having our kids uh, in their clinics. And other, other issues are, which is really interesting about internal medicine physicians. I mean, I, I would say the majority of people here are probably pediatricians um, and family practice doctors but, and, and nurses and other people. But I would say that um, uh, for internal medicine doctors, they like to diagnose the stuff that, is, that the people have when they come through the door. They don't like to be told what the person has before they show up, which is really interesting. Um, but it, uh, it is definitely a barrier for our families finding adult care providers. And yes, and we have, uh, there's a program called ACCESS um, in San Francisco. Are you in San Francisco? No, I'm in San Jose. Uh, San Jose. I'm actually a GPA, but I have a BA in public health. Um, and I, I can't remember the office of the study, but there was a study done on specialty chips. Um, and it was really well, maybe grab the mic for her. Uh, ouch. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't remember the authors, but there was a study done on tr um, sp uh, specialty transition health clinics, and it was, uh, and it's specifically for those individuals with complex health care needs. Um, you know, and as a behaviorist, I, I just, I see a really big gap in which the, you know, our fields, the medical and the, and the behavioral fields could, um, you know, could work together because we're, you know, as a behavioral health agency, we work with insurance, but we're really not doing that outreach with training physicians' office uh, to mm. offices or ER staff. I see more in the news, that's, but it's like, oh, hey, here's this neat little project instead of a widespread standard. Um, and so I don't know. I, I, the transition clinic had mixed results, but I feel like if that was more of a standard practice and if they included health planning in transition programming, in that post-secondary leaving high school phase, I think that could do a lot to ameliorate the concerns of health professionals and then you could increase the number of providers who do serve, who feel competent and confident to serve these adults. I think for kids who go to public school, that is a great idea to be able to have um, a transition clinic that is out of, um, out of the school itself um, is a wonderful, it's a wonderful idea, it's a great, great model. I can understand that that would have made a big difference in people's lives. More questions? So, yeah, so yeah. a comment. <clears throat> so I've been working in internal medicine as a nurse practitioner taking care of adults with developmental disabilities, many of them graduating from Lucy's practice to mine. And, and I do a lot of training for our, my colleagues. And I, do, I actually I have to um, disagree with the, your portrayal of internal medicine. I think it's because of a lack of training and comfort level of dealing with um, an adult who comes in with multiple conditions. Uh, so uh, doing grand rounds that I've done several times, I get a great interest in, in adult and in my colleague, internal medicine colleagues, uh, to, um, to know more about it and to feel more competent about uh, seeing these patients. So I think it's a matter of training. We now have more training uh, at the medical student and nurse practitioner student level, which is great. It really needs to start earlier. So I think there's great interest and there's great need for, for more training. So I have two questions for you. Yeah. I was struck by why hypotonic conditions are not uh, covered. And I also wondered if nurse practitioners are paneled in CCS as providers. So those are my two questions. Um, so nurse practitioners are paneled um, as providers, but not as subspecialty providers. So one of the tricky parts about nurse practitioners is that this program is really to guarantee access to, the, to subspecialist physicians. And the reason is because the length of training for subspecialist physicians generally is longer than for nurse practitioners. That being said, there are incredible nurse practitioners out there, and the program wants to figure out how to support those nurse practitioners as providers. At this point, um, what I th it hasn't come out yet, but they're working on a numbered letter on some guidance around how we can support nurse practitioner care without, um, uh, without uh, pushing um, medical centers 
to uh, push more patients out of physician care and to nurse practitioner care um, because it's lower cost. So they, um, the idea is that if the physician specialist that the nurse practitioner is working with, if they, if the nurse, if the physician specialist can, um, can sort of outline what parts of the care the nurse practitioner should be taken care of so that it's almost like it's directed by the pediatric subspecialist physician for the, the complex child, and then the nurse practitioner can run with it, then they'll probably uh, be paid as a nurse practitioner, as, as a provider of care that way. Um, but up to this point, that's been a very tricky issue. And when talking about um, hypotonia, again, um, not all children with hypotonia are excluded. It's just that, um, in general, a lot of the kids with genetic conditions that um, are associated with hypotonia, where the kids definitely have equipment needs and they definitely could use the physical and occupational therapy guidance of the therapist, the issue is that um, many of those kids aren't able to achieve like advancing goals because of their hypotonia and the way that the therapy is all goal oriented it 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 has created a rift right where you know my, in an ideal world it would be great for our therapist to be able to provide equipment consultation to families who have uh, children with hypotonia, but maybe not necessarily the, the therapy that's, sp that's uh, specific to spasticity and trying to overcome spasticity, which is a lot of what the therapy is in the medical therapy unit. So it's a really good question and it's tricky. Good morning. My Good morning. name is Ainsley Shawcross. I'm a care coordinator with San Francisco Health Plan. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to be at the conference. Um, so I have an additional comment to your presentation, which was great, and a question. So my comment is I wanted to let everyone here know that San Francisco Health Plan has a uh, short-term case management program for children transitioning out of CCS to San Francisco Health Plan to make sure that they're connected with their providers and they have everything they need to be supported once they turn 21. Um, my question, so I'm currently working with a 13-month-year-old 13 who is covered by CCS and we're having trouble getting him a uh, portable con oxygen concentrator. It seems that <laughs> um, DME vendors only use them for short-term travel, um, but he needs it more long-term. And no one, none of the vendors want to, um, the provider who made the auth even went to different DME vendors. Um, is it possible for CCS, is it in your scope to purchase an oxygen concentrator, a portable one, from the manufacturer? Um, it would probably have to come through a Medi-Cal approved vendor. Um, but yeah, we, we purchase, we, we can purchase concentrators. The, so one thing that makes this also complicated is that, I mean, let's make life complicated for these families who have complicated lives. So. CCS um, ends up, a, a child's eligible condition is the one that gets case managed and the one that, uh, where all the care gets paid for through CCS. Everything else gets shuttled to Medi-Cal like San Francisco Health Plan. So if we have a child with a seizure disorder, an intractable seizure disorder, and that child is eligible for CCS because of their intractable seizure disorder, but their pulmonary condition is not one that is covered under CCS. For example, asthma, CCS doesn't do everyday primary care, th things that can occur um, that should be cared for by the primary care physician, these are not likely going to be CCS eligible conditions. So if that child has a need for an oxygen concentrator because of uh, some condition that isn't CCS eligible, then the pulmonary care that you're talking about is actually supposed to be care is supposed to be paid for by Medi-Cal by San Francisco Health Plan. So in that case, we wouldn't cover the oxygen concentrator. But he if we are, he has the qualifying condition he for CCS for pulmonary mm -hmm. for pulmonary. So yeah, contact contact his case manager at CCS. You can even come talk to me, and we can make sure that happens. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. <clears throat> Are we caught up, Lucy? Are we still going? 
So Ben, How I just had hey another, John. another <clears throat> I, I'm a stealth CCS person too. So yes, you retired are. anew and extra help. Anyway, <laughs> the, could you, another really important point, especially with the medical managed care, is that my understanding is that CCS covers some things that regular Medi-Cal doesn't. And we are told that the medical Medi-Cal managed care also has to follow the CCS policies and provide the benefits that CCS provides, which some of which are in excess of what plain Medi-Cal costs. Does that sound right to you? Um, in the whole child model counties, that is correct. Yes. Like where, if now that they've taken over right, the CCS, right, right. Um, the CCS responsibilities, they're yeah, supposed yeah. to be able to access medications and, uh, and therapies and things that Medi-Cal wouldn't normally cover, right, right. but for specific um, yeah, yeah. medical conditions, they should. Yeah. Um, the trick is here oh. that under the whole child model plan in Medi-Cal managed care uh, controlled counties, um, often those kids, since they fall underneath Medi-Cal managed care, um, they're not identifying them as CCS. They're just continuing to care for them. Right. And when that happens, they then don't have the, uh, they don't, they don't have um, the access to those parts of CCS that right. Medi-Cal doesn't yeah. cover, right? So that's But I tricky. think for the people that are taking care of them, the doctors taking care of them in the regional center, they have to understand that, yes, they're supposed to do this, and yes, we can get on their case about it. But I think it's also true that CCS does provide certain things that regular Medi-Cal doesn't cover generally. That's correct. So, so that's a cool thing. Yeah, we can break the rules. Thank you. No, you got your Thank own you. Rules. <laughs> I mean, we can break, we can break the boundaries. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.